Everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. So what do you want to talk about? That's what I was going to ask you. Man, I don't want to talk about anything. You're the one paying, remember? Not paying that much. You want to pay me more? You okay? Yeah, it's just junk food. <laughs> These guys have to be here? I didn't realize you'd be filming. We can stop if you're uncomfortable. Yeah, right. Well, let's hurry up. I've got a uh, doctor's appointment in one hour. Okay. What's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane? There's no difference between us. We do the same job. But you're not a real pilot. And so what? You're not a real journalist. No, I mean... I know what you mean. You're talking about bodies and places. Euclidean shit. Like train drivers in the 1880s or something. You sure you're okay? There was this guy here who loved trains, you know. I don't know, it's like a 40-year-old guy. Um, harmless, maybe a little retarded. His dad bought him a train set when he was a baby, and that was the last time he saw him. Loves trains ever since. You know, most of us outgrow this phase when we discover sports and jerking off, but this guy didn't. His obsession just grew. He watched the trains for years. He hung around train yards, made friends with mechanics, like a medieval apprentice. He learned it all just by looking. Wait a minute. Is this someone you served with? Anyway, one day he goes to the driver's lounge at the station and pulls out a bolt cutter. He breaks open a locker and puts on a uniform. He takes the vest, the ID card, even the shoes, and goes to work like it's nobody's business. Out on the platform is just past lunchtime. The staff has full bellies and nobody notices. He boards a train full of commuters and sits in the driver's seat. He pulls the handbrake or whatever and he's off. He drives the big choo-choo train all day long, making all the right stops on time. The motherfucker could have won an award for on-time performance. Funny thing is, the light at the end of the tunnel is just another tunnel. What does that mean? I don't know. Irony? Disappointment? The retard left his keys in the real driver's locker. He only realized it when he got home later that night. The police caught him trying to break into his own house by climbing in through his own window. Okay, so why does the guy have to be black? I didn't say he was black. Did anyone mention color? The guy took a public train for a joyride and got busted climbing in through his own window. I didn't say anything about race. That's all there is to it. All right. What does this have to do with being a drone pilot? The moral's the same, all right? You keep your work life and your domestic life separate. You're not serious. You don't like it? Why don't you ask me a better question? All right. Have you ever seen the light of God?
5,000 feet is the best. We love it when we're sitting at 5,000 feet. You have more description. Um, plus, at 5,000 feet, I mean, I can tell you what type of shoes you wear <laughs> from a mile away. <laughs> I can tell you what type of clothes the person's wearing, it's like they have a beard, their hair color, and everything else. So they're very clear cameras on board. Um, we have the IR infrared, which we can switch to automatically. And that'll pick up any heat signatures or cold signatures. I mean, if someone sits down, let's say, on a cold surface for a while and then gets up, you'll still see the heat from that person for a long time. It kind of looks like a white blossom just shining up into heaven. It's quite beautiful. Um, I mean, heck, if you see somebody light up a cigarette on there, that's a huge beacon. <laughs> you just see a very white glow coming from that area. And you're just on a preset path flying a circular orbit, watching them as they're smoking from about two to three miles away. You could be following them and they wouldn't hear you nor see you. And um, I'll set the laser um, on a spot. You'll see a box pop up. And what it does is it locks in those pixels as we're circulating. And the computer will uh, figure out the trajectory, the distance, and the speed, and come up with an estimated time that it would take for the missile to impact. Um, the pilot will get all the clearances that are necessary to fire. He'll release the missile, and I'll guide it in onto its target. Everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. Everything's okay. So what do you want to talk about? That's what I was going to ask you. Man, I don't want to talk about anything. You're the one paying, remember? Not paying that much. You want to pay me more? You okay? Oh, yeah, it's just junk food. So these guys have to be here? I didn't realize we'd be filming. We can always stop if you're uncomfortable. Yeah, right. Well, let's hurry up. I've got a doctor's appointment in one hour. OK. What's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane? There's no difference between us. We do the same job. But you're not a real pilot. So what? You're not a real journalist. No, 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 I mean... I know what you mean. You're thinking about bodies and trenches. Rats running around, mustard gas, World War I. Right? You sure you're okay? You hear about that couple that caught the Luxor? They check into hotels with this one big suitcase full of trousers, blue jeans, chinos, slacks, you name it. A whole selection of labels and sizes. The man would hang them up in the shower, wool to cotton, light to dark. The woman would dress for business and put on a name tag like she's in town for a conference. 
Then they'd say goodbye like it's the last time they'll see each other. He would go down first to play the slots, and she'd cruise the casino alone, prowling around for the right target. What's the right target? Everyone. Clueless tourists, convention goers, university students, divorcees, anyone wearing trousers who's single and in possession of credit. Anyway, after chatting them up and making sure they're not dangerous, the woman would invite them up to her room. She'd act all sexy and mysterious in the elevator, telling them she's married, but that nothing turns her on more than the one night stand in Sin City, blah, blah, whatever. As soon as they stepped through the door, she'd be all over them. It was never really clear how much was acting and how much desperation. She'd tear off their pants and then show them just enough to want to wait on the bed while she went to the little girl's room. Where all the pants were. Exactly. In the bathroom, she'd pick out a pair, just like the ones the guy in the bed had, and then do a little switcheroo before getting back in the sack. But just then, her partner would walk in and pretend to discover them. You can imagine the rest. There'd be chaos, lots of gorilla-type shoving and throwing stuff, and the half-naked man would be allowed to run out or he'd be thrown out, sometimes with the wrong trousers and sometimes with no trousers at all. Come on. The thing with the pants is a bit much. Oh, really? For most men, being caught with their pants down is so mortifying that they'd rather lose their wallet than hang around naked in a hotel corridor. Either way, those who stuck around and made a racket would get their pants back after the relevant details were copied off their credit cards. All right. What does this have to do with being a drone pilot? Nothing. I work for casino security now. We tell these stories to make our life a little less boring. Okay, so getting back to Afghanistan. Pakistan. Right. Tell me about one of your missions. Usually after we got done with work and then getting back home, you had about two hours before you had to go to sleep for work the next night. Because usually I wouldn't get home until 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, you jump to the shower to get your breakfast, play some video games for, you know, for four hours and then try to sleep. <laughs> A lot of guys, believe it or not, over there play video games <laughs> in their free time. Um, I guess that's their way of unwinding. Mine were a lot of role-playing games, or flight simulators. I, I guess Predator is similar to playing a video game, but playing the same video game four years straight, every single day on the same level. Like one time I just watched the same house for a month straight <laughs> for at least 11 hours every day for a month. <laughs> but then you have your moments when there's a real emergency going on, and that's just where stress comes into play. How do I hit that truck? And in what way do I hit that truck? And how far away should I put the missile to get the truck? So that way I don't have any damage to the surrounding buildings or to the people or hurt anybody else's life that's around there. And uh, sometimes I make mistakes. I mean, there's horror sides to working private. You see a lot of death. You know, you see it all, as I said, they can tell you what type of shoes you're wearing from that far away. Hell, it's pretty clear about everything else that's happening. 
I mean, there came a point after you know five years of doing this that it's just I, I had to think about, wow, there's, there's so much loss of life that was a direct result of me. I mean, there was a lot of personal stuff I had to go through, a lot of chaplains I had to talk to just because. And the one factor that they talked about that helped me is that if it wasn't me who was doing it, then some new, some new kid would be doing it, but worse. I was 26 at the time. And a lot of people look like, how can you have PTSD if you weren't actively in a war zone? Well, technically speaking, every single day I was active in a war zone. I mean, I may not have been personally in harm, but I was directly affecting people's lives over there every single day. Um, there's stress that comes with that. I mean, with having a fire, or having a, to see some of the, the death, to, to see what's going on, um, having anxiety, um, looking back on a certain situation or incident over and over and over, you know, uh, bad dreams, loss of sleep. You know, it's not like a video game. <laughs> I can't switch it off. It's always there. Just, um, there's, there was a lot of stress with that, and they kind of call it virtual stress. Would you like me to clean your room, sir? Or should I come back? Should I clean your room? It's not my room. I'm visiting someone. I'll come back later, sir. My lucky day. So what do you want to talk about? That's what I was going to ask you. <laughs> Man, I don't want to talk about anything. You're the one paying, remember? Not paying that much. You want to pay me more? You're okay? Mm, that's just junk food. <coughs> These guys have to be here? I didn't realize you'd be filming. We can always stop if you're uncomfortable. Yeah, right. Okay, then, well, can we hurry up? I've got a doctor's appointment in one hour. Okay. What's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane? Uh, there's no difference between us. We do the same job. But you're not a real pilot. So what? You're not a real journalist. No, I mean... I know what you mean. You're thinking about Orville and Wilbur, Kitty Hawk, Top Gun, Red Baron, whatever. Sure you're okay? Mom, Dad, Johnny, and little Zoe are going on a little trip. Let's say it's the weekend and the family loves the outdoors. Or maybe they need to get away for a while because of problems Dad's having with the provisional authority. Either way, on a bright Friday morning, they pack up the station wagon with food and blankets and good stuff for the long drive. And they leave their house locked for good. So the family drives down their quiet block on a weekend morning on their way to the country. They take a left and a right, stop at the usual checkpoints, 
present their documents to the occupying forces. It's the same familiar route Dad takes every day of the week when he drives to work. But now he's not driving to work, so instead of driving into town, he gets on the freeway. No, 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 no camera. The drive is long, the trip is boring. Pretty soon everyone is passed out in the car except for Dad. Mom has a map in her bag somewhere in the back, but Dad is a proud, caring husband, and he doesn't want to wake her. In these parts of the country, it's hard to get lost anyway. There's one road, and it snakes along the mountains forever. Inshallah, we'll get there. One hour later, the roads aren't so good anymore. Dad isn't sure if they're lost, but the road looks familiar, so he puts faith in his instincts. The car bumps along at a much slower pace when Dad suddenly sees several men up ahead. They're digging or doing some work on the road. There's also a white pickup truck, something very common to the folks who live out here in the middle of nowhere. Dad slows down even more. It's not strange to see farmers out here, although these guys are not in the field, and there's no sign saying there's road work ahead. The men spot the car and stop what they're doing. They step onto the road and watch as the family gets nearer. Dad can see that one of them has a shovel and the other two have some working tools or maybe sticks. Are they shepherds? There are no goats anywhere, no sheep, no camels. The earth on the side of the road is like hard clay. Digging into it with one shovel is no walk in the park. Dad stops the car about 50 feet away. He can see the men very clearly now. The one with the shovel is younger, almost a teenager. He wears a traditional headdress. The other two are older. They're dressed in clothes more typical to tribes from further south, and they're armed with Kalashnikovs. Dad looks at the men. The men look at Dad. He knows who they are and what they're doing, but he doesn't care. It's none of his business. He just wants to be allowed to pass and is not looking for trouble. One of the men waves Dad along, but also holds up his weapon. The other man approaches. Both he and the digger look on with suspicion. Dad edges the car forward. Just then, Mom wakes up. She sees the men and is immediately close to panicking. Dad whispers for her to be quiet and continues. The men are almost in line with the car now. They bend forward, peering in. Fortunately, the kids are still sleeping. Dad passes the men slowly and then steps on the gas. The crisis is over and it's best to get out of here. The men watch as the car pulls away. Dad takes mom's hand and squeezes it. Just then, a shrieking sound pierces the still air, cleaving through it like the cry of a heavenly messenger. The Hellfire missile hits the ground before anyone can react, nearly vaporizing the three men on impact. The pickup truck takes most of the damage, but the station wagon isn't spared. It pulls up ahead and waits, generously, patiently. Time passes. Time is on my side. Seeing the world from above doesn't just flatten things. It sharpens them. It makes relationships clearer. The family continues their journey. Their bodies will never be buried. Sorry, I gotta take this. I'll be back in a minute.
on that specific mission of the night, I was checking routes for IEDs, looking for improvised explosive devices. And I would just be searching through the streets, a lot of side streets. I'll scan those roads, and it was a night here in Vegas, and it was a daytime there. Um, but I came to a spot in the middle of the road that was darker than the road itself, which for the infrared camera means that darker images are showing as warmer. And it looked like there was a line going. Now, uh, what they didn't know at the time, which they do know now, which is not classified, really, is that when an individual digs up soil and tries to put a metallic object underneath the soil, that metallic object is showing a different temperature than the surrounding soil. Because it's handled and then put down there and it hasn't had a chance to just absorb into that ambient temperature of the surrounding area. Um, you'll see it quite clearly when you're looking at an infrared image. And then when you have a length of wire as well that was spooled up in a different temperature area, and you put that on the road and try to shuffle up dirt, now that dirt is a different temperature. It'll either be cooler or hotter from shuffling around the cord. Now following the line, it goes to the side of the road where there was some houses that weren't fully constructed. And I'm looking around, and I'm seeing a little guy smoking on the roof, and this wannabe terrorist is just sitting there, and he's being real slick, not even moving. Just looking around constantly, trying to, waiting for, you know, a Humvee or one of the military vehicles to show up to detonate, and there's, you know, four or five guys, and they're just sticking around. You can tell they're up to no good, that there's, you know, an ambush. Um, so we call it in, and then we're given all the clearances that are necessary, all the approvals and everything else. Then we did something called the Light of God, the Marines like to call it the Light of God. It's our uh, laser targeting marker. Uh, we just send out a beam laser, and when the troops put on their uh, night vision goggles, they'll just see this light that looks like it's coming from heaven, poof, right on the spot, <laughs> coming out of nowhere from the sky. It's quite beautiful. Um, then usually we have other outside observers that come into the GCS at this point, just to kind of watch and to monitor the situation. And um, the people who sit in the main building, they have projected images up on the wall of the camera feeds that are coming out, like everything up to the Pentagon can see what we're doing on this feed. And we fired off a Hellfire missile and got the target. I mean, they didn't quite stand into me that, hey, I just killed someone. My first time, I was within my first year there. It didn't quite impact. You know, it was later on through a couple more missions that the dreams started. 